Good morning, everybody. It's great to see you, and thank you so much, MB, uh, for that introduction. I will tell you, the last National School Climate Survey found that uh, LGBT high school students, if they had just one role model in the STEM fields while they were in high school, were twice as likely to say that they would uh, major in a STEM field when they got to college. So I hope that MB has set up effectively. Not only are there great role models out there, uh, people like MB who've done amazing work in government with data, but it really matters. So oh, let's keep that front and center for everybody. Um, it, as I said, it is really wonderful to be with you all this morning and to see you all here. It is truly an inspiration. And I think we'd all agree we all need as much inspiration as we can possibly get these days. Um, I don't know about you, but every day for the past few months, I have gone through pretty much a daily cycle. All right, it goes like this. First, I'll get some new piece of information. It comes like a bolt out of the blue. There's some new facts out there about something going on in the state of the world, some development right here in Washington, DC, and I get a jolt of despair. Okay, how can this possibly be, right? How could they be doing this? How could this be true? What's going on? Then pretty quickly, I find defiance kicks in. All right, this new information I just got, there are things that we value deeply that we care about values, core values that we all hold very dear that are being attacked or called into question. And that cannot stand. And then finally, and this is the part that actually gets me out of bed and out to work, I kind of reassemble the building blocks of experience and knowledge, those battle scars of all the past struggles and all the victories and all the work that we've done to date into the kind of the armor of the determination that actually keeps us all going. Fortunately, as we face all the challenges we have today, we have so much to build on. So actually my job this morning, data geek that I usually am, Mary Beth is not wrong, um, my job is a little different because in just a moment, we're gonna hear incredibly important information from the CDC itself about lesbian, gay, and bisexual youth health from the National Youth Risk Behavior Survey. Now I say LGB specifically because trans, there is information about trans youth health we will have in the near future. Um, and Dr. Ethier will talk a little bit more about that. But this information is some pretty tough stuff. It's one of those jolts that can um, put you into a bad place with this simple question. How can this be? You're gonna hear some things and I bet every one of you is gonna have a moment. How can this be today in 2017? So my job in partnership with Dr. Ethier is to put this information into context so that we all get through that full cycle back to defiance and determination. So let me take you back for just a moment before we dive into the snapshot we now have of today. When GLSEN was first founded in 1990 and we began our work vowing that we were gonna transform K through 12 education to make sure that every school in this country was a safe and affirming place for all LGBT youth, we faced a lot of opposition and a lot of skepticism. I mean, back then, let's just reality check, Back in 1990, it was not definitively legal to be gay in this country. It was illegal to be gay in a number of states. In fact, it was not definitively legal in this country to be gay until 2003, right? That's not that long ago. So let's put this all into, into perspective. GLSEN actually faced several phases of its history where we had to collect the data and the experience and the evidence to answer a number of questions. And I'll tell you, the first question that GLSEN had to answer was, LG, do LGBT youth even exist, right? Back in 1990, there was this very much a prevailing idea, there was no such thing as an LGBT person. Mostly people would just say gay. There was no such thing as a gay person until someone left home, went to college, and decided they were gonna make that choice. That's how it worked. 
So when Glisten showed up and said, no, actually, we're a collection of parents and educators and students and con concerned members of the community who want to talk about what's happening right now in K through 12 schools, like, there's no such thing as a gay student. In, uh, there's no such thing as an LGBT student K through 12. A lot of work that went into that had to do with a process of coming out, people telling their stories, beginning to amass the evidence that that was true. And by the late 90s, we'd entered a new phase, and there was a new question. And the new question at that point was, OK, so maybe there are these people, maybe there are these youth K through 12. What difference does it make? You know, you know, what difference does it make? Let's actually start talking then. Glisten had to start talking about, OK, here's what it's like. We're going to tell you some stories. We're going to gather some e information, gather some evidence. All right, here's what it's actually like to go to school K through 12 if you're an LGBT person. And then quickly we tipped into something else that was very dangerous and scary at the time in the late 1990s. What should we do about it? All right, these youth exist. Their lives are difficult. There are specific challenges. I know. You know, if you're going to have LGBT youth and you're going to have these things called gay-straight alliances or gender and sexuality alliances, as we call them now, uh, which Glisten had been supporting all the way through since the early 90s, um, if you're going to have that, actually, you then have to offer those students a choice and a way out. So if you have a GSA, obviously what you need to do is bring in speakers about reparative therapy, because really what these, what these students need is to not be LGBT. That's how we're going to solve this problem. This was an actual battle that we fought in school district, Montgomery County. Uh, there was an organization called PFOX. Anyone here remember PFOX? Parents and friends of ex-gays that showed up in Montgomery County and said to the schools, if you have GSAs, you better have uh, ex-gay therapy available for all your students, or else you'll be liable if your students get HIV. You may still hear these arguments today. They're starting to come back. But when I began at GLSEN, we were just beginning a wonderful transition from that last question, that battle over what to do about, you know, how should it, what's the right response? A path out of homosexuality um, and a path out of being transgender or a path towards um, affirming uh, these students' right to exist to a new phase of this, of this whole conversation. What is it that works? What is it is the right response to ensure that these students are safe and affirmed? And um, it led us to a period of time where GLSEN was amassing the experience of the first 10 years of our history. What are the programs and practices and school-based supports that actually transform school climate and begin to make them work better for every child that walks through those doors? We began to test and evaluate them. We began to track their impact on the world. And in 1999, we launched our National School Climate Survey, where every two years we would ask LGBT youth about their experience and find out what things were making the biggest difference for them in school. And as we did this, we were in many moments battling with um, an education world that was still being dragged from there aren't these, these students don't exist. What has that got to do with school anyway? You're just trying to sexualize the class. All the kinds of stuff I'm sure you've heard over and over again. Um, and so when I first came to Glisten, I turned to my boss, a guy named Kevin Jennings, and we were launching a new strategic plan for the early first years of this century. And I said, okay, Kevin, here's the thing. I'm your deputy executive director. It's my job to implement this plan. How will I know at the end of this time whether we have achieved our goals and whether this has worked. And Kevin said, the way we'll know if this has worked is if the education world understands that GLSEN and the LGBT community is here to partner with them to make schools better and help serve their students better. And, we will have, and it will have worked if they are willing to stand alongside us publicly and say that that is so. So we set out um, to achieve that. It always involved bringing together the data and the lived experience of people in schools and taking it to the decision makers who could really make a difference. Which brings me to the coalition effort that makes this presentation today actually possible. All this time, we were doing the National School Climate Survey, and every year we would hear, oh my gosh, this is unbelievable data, but that's you, Glisten, asking the question. How can we actually uh, 
rely on this. So we held ourselves to higher and higher and higher standards. We always, you know, all, all of that. But when it came down to it, we really understood that for this to be fully integrated, not to be bolted on, but to become an integral part of how schools understand their job to serve young people, we were gonna have to make sure that the question, are you lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, that the question, do you have sex with people of the same sex? Do, what is your experience? How do you identify yourself? The whole range of ways that any student from any community in this country might think about who they are be an integral part of how the education world understands what's going on in schools and learns how to respond to that reality. So in 2010, GLSEN, Advocates for Youth, and GSA Network came together to form something called the All Students Count Coalition. We're quickly joined by Center for American Progress and HRC and began a national campaign to get states to understand why they needed to know what was going on. It went for years. It had ancillary projects alongside to try to get other federal data collection to include LGBT youth. We're pleased to now have um, information in the civil rights data collection that happens at the Department of Ed and in the school survey on crime and safety, uh, also administered out of the Department of Education, and now in the YRBS. And what happened was that this coalition, all of us together, students, educators, researchers, practitioners, went out in the field and talked to the people who were tasked with making schools better by doing the research and helping schools learn about what's going on and making the case to them with that combination of uh, research and experience. And we heard, confidentially, but I'll share it with you now with no names attached, when it came time to make the vote, to actually vote on whether this question, would, these questions about LGB youth first, we're still testing the transgender question in the field, but when the, when the time came to vote on that, it was the least controversial decision that that body had ever taken up about adding a question, and it was pretty much unanimous. And that's what happens when all of us get together and make the case and build ourselves in. And for me, what it means, I mean, give us all a hand on this. And what that means to me right now, and what, as I turn, about to turn it over to Kathleen, is that it is hard to undo that level of a victory, all right? Uh, I'll be back after uh, Dr. Eth here just to wrap up with some specific asks of all of you, but just remember, when things look pretty bad out there, we have won some things that are very difficult to undo because we have put in the time, we have brought the evidence, we have brought our whole hearts and told our whole stories, and it's very hard to ever take that away from us. So, with all that said, I'm gonna turn it over now to Dr. Kathleen Ethier, who is the director of CDC's Division of Adolescent and School Health, otherwise known as CDC Dash. I think you heard about CDC Dash from Senator Franken last night. Um, Dr. Ethier, I will say just on a personal note, is an incredible ally and champion uh, for all of our issues from within the CDC. She is one of those dedicated career civil service employees who has made it her job, administration after administration, to stand up for what works for youth and what works for schools. Um, so again, as we think about what's happening today, remember, there are people who have been through this and been through many things and who continue to stand up for what's right. There are partners. There are partners in getting this right. And so it is my distinct honor to introduce uh, Dr. Eth here, a social psychologist who before, this, before heading up CDC Dash was the director of CDC's program evaluation and perform, performance and evaluation office um, and one of our most um, beloved and important allies right now within the CDC. Please join me in welcoming <coughs> Dr. Eth here, Kathleen.
morning. You count. You've heard that several times already this morning, but what are we telling someone when we tell them that they count? We're telling them that they matter. We're telling them that we see them. We're telling them that they're valued. We also say in public health that you can't fix what you don't measure. And at CDC, data is the basis for all of our efforts. Last year, as Eliza mentioned, the CDC released the first nationwide report on sexual minority youth from the YRBS, the Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance System. We estimated that 1.7 million high school students in this country identify as gay, lesbian, or bisexual, or have same-sex partners. 1.7 million high school students. You can take that number and you can use it. We know that it's a really good estimate. There may be more for many reasons, but that's a huge number. And having that number allows us to do a number of things. Our data also showed what many of you already knew, that the issues faced by sexual minority youth are wide ranging and difficult, including greater risk than their straight peers for violence, substance use, sexual risk, and attempted suicide. I brought one slide with me and I pulled those pieces of data out of a series of probably 20 slides that I could have brought and presented to you this morning. What they demonstrate is that close to 20% of our LGBT identify, LGB identified youth were ever forced to have sexual intercourse. That a huge number of them did not go to school because of safety concerns. That more than a third experienced bullying on school property. That 5% of them or more used a needle to inject drugs. And that almost 30% had ever attempted suicide. We have to step back from that and really think about what's happening, particularly in our schools, where this data is reflected. These are kids in school who are experiencing these challenges. So what do we do with this data now that we have it? What we don't do is use it to further stigmatize LBGTQ youth. What we don't do is say it's their fault that they're injecting drugs. We try to understand what it means when a, when a higher percentage of LGB identified youth say they've used a needle to inject drugs. But we use that data wherever we can to point out what the needs are. I have to say it, you know, it's great that we can all come out as public health data geeks today. Um, I think it's, I feel really good about that. Um, and as a, as a public health data geek, it was so heartening to hear Senator Franken use our data last night in his speech. And so what I want to do is I want to encourage all of you to use the data to make the case for what needs to be done. Because the data points us there. Most of what we see in this data, at its roots, is about social isolation, is about stigma, is about the need for connection. And this data tells us about the importance of schools. For full disclosure, I'm just going to say that I'm the proud spouse of a middle school um, health and PE teacher. So for me, <laughs> schools are incredibly important. <laughs> but we know that schools can be protective for youth in so many ways. That youth who feel connected to their schools and to the important adults in their schools are less likely to experience violence, are less likely to use substances, are less likely to have risky sex. But what these data also show us is that schools can be a risky place for sexual minority youth. And that's something that we can and something we must fix. On my next slide, I'm going to uh, give you a shameless plug for a whole set of resources that CDC DASH provides for those of you who work in schools and those of you who work in communities and anybody who works with LGBTQ youth. Um, on this slide are links to the full data system. So Youth Online, you can go in and you can use the data and you can look at it in all different ways. We've made it as user-friendly as possible because we want you to use this data. Data only lives. It only goes beyond being numbers on a page if you use it. 
to make the case for increased resources, to make the case for what you know needs to be done, to help you figure out more about what needs to be done. I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the lack of data on transgender youth. And I want to say that it is not because transgender youth don't count. I am happy to say that we are currently piloting a transgender identification question in the 2017 YRBS survey in 15 states. And that is literally happening right, well not literally today, because it's Saturday, but on Friday and again on Monday, it will be literally the case that um, that state survey in 15 states is being, um, is being implemented. And so we'll know next year whether or not we were able to get some accurate counts in um, the number of youth who identify as transgender. Um, that look at that data is going to involve our partners. Um, like Listen, we could not do any of that work without that coalition of people who are pushing us further and further to really be able to make the case for all LGBTQ youth, um, but also to help us reflect back in their own surveys and look at our data versus their data to see whether or not we're really being able to, to get accurate counts. We hope to have this, um, these questions in the national survey as soon as we can. Um, and so we hope you know and we want to say that we understand how important it is to be able to count all of our youth. Finally, on behalf of CDC and personally, I just wanna take a minute to thank you all for the incredible work that you do to improve the lives of our kids. We are privileged and honored at CDC to help you however we can. Um, feel free to stop back. We've, CDC has several booths back there. Please free to stop by and tell us how we can help you. Tell us what more we can do. Tell us what you need to better serve our youth because I think for all of us, that is ultimately our goal. So thank you so much. I appreciate the work that you do and thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Kathleen. And as I say, again, one of those moments where you look at uh, the data and think, my God, how can this be in 2017 that we are still looking at this kind of experience gap? But the thing to remember is that even as we look at that data, we do so from a place that is so vastly different than when we started this, not just in 1990, but also in 2000. So just to wrap this up, I want to show you, I'm going to show you three more slides because I want to remind you the extent to which we are winning. We are winning this battle to close that gap as dire as it is. So first, I want to show you, this now is data from GLSEN's National School Climate Survey. And, um, this really demonstrates, really for GLSEN, and I'm sure you hear this over and over again now in the sessions that you will attend and in all the work that you do, there are four basic school-based supports that make the, a world of difference in changing school climate and making sure that LGBT youth are safe and respected. Those four things are affirming LGBTQ inclusive uh, school policies at the school and district level, the presence of a student club, a gay straight alliance or gender and sexuality alliance um, in the school, the presence of supportive educators, supportive adults in the school community, and accurate and positive depictions of LGBT people, history and events in the curriculum, across the curriculum, whether it's about sexuality and health, whether it is about history, whether it is about the the couple that's referenced in a math problem, frankly. Just being present in the community in the way that anyone else is. And of course for us, this question of inclusion, inclusion and affirmation is um, enriched and complicated by the fact that the youth that we all serve and the youth that we all are or were at some point in our lives um, are drawn from every community in this country, are drawn from every religion, every race, every immigration status, and those are every uh, different kind of ability. 
And th the responses that affirm an LGBTQ youth truly have to be whole child responses in thinking about who that person is on their own terms. But if you look at this graph, since 2007, we began tracking these things in 2001. Look what has happened since 2007. Across the board, we are seeing an increase of the presence of these supports in schools across the country. And as a result, the next slide will show you, uh, if we go to the next slide, during that same period of time, look at what has changed. This represents a decline in the harassment, the daily harassment that LGBTQ youth face simply going to school on the basis of sexual orientation and on gender expression. When we look at gender identity, this is still something that we need uh, to work on because the slope is not as strong and the focus is there now in a way uh, that I think the rest of the education community is beginning to wrestle with to a much greater extent they have in the past but we have already made so much progress. So today, as we go into a new phase of all of our work to ensure that we hold the line on the progress we made and that indeed we continue to push forward, we have to put those values of respect for all, the values of serving the whole child into action in every school across the country. And if I think back, quick story to close this out, when I think back to when I started at Glisten and I asked Kevin Jennings that question, he said, I want to go back to the prior slide. I don't want to lose that. Can we go back, please? We've rotated off the slide. Um, when, I was, when I first asked Kevin about winning the trust of the education world, he said, okay, here's the thing. We have amazing allies already, and some of them are still are standing with you today. Uh, the NEA, the AFT, the counselors, the school psychologists, the people who knew forever and ever how difficult this were, was, this job was, and what exactly was going on have been, our, have been those pioneering partners. But there has been reluctance in the education world to stand up and stand for these things um, directly and publicly. So Kevin said, now I'll really know that you've won if you can do a couple things. If you can get, um, if you get the National School Boards Association on, if you get the national PTA on, if you get the superintendents to stand up for this publicly. Remember, this is 2000, so if there are folks from those associations in the room, I salute you, things have come a long way. But here's what happened the day after the election. The day after the election, our friends from the Southern Poverty Law Center called us and said, look, we're starting to get all these reports. What are you hearing about what's going on in the field? And we heard the same thing. There were more and more reports that students were testing these new boundaries. Hey, if this guy could win the presidency, must be okay to say this stuff. Let's see, what's at, let's, let's see what we can get away with, right? And we heard about adults who were going there as well in a different spirit. So what we did was we reached out now years later, 16 years later, to the partners who have become our uh, allies in this fight and said, hey, we have to take action together. We need you, we need the leadership of school communities to stand up and do something. And at that point, we could draft a statement like this. At a time when specific groups of students are being targeted, we must ensure that those students specifically know that they are safe and their schools welcome them. All education stakeholders must take action immediately to support all students, particularly those who face bias incidents in their schools, and to stand up for the inclusive values that are at the core of a good education. These actions should specifically affirm the right of all students regardless of race, color, national origin, immigration status, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, disability, or religion to be educated in an environment free from fear, violence, and intimidation. And I need you to know that within 72 hours, we had not only the superintendents, not only the National PTA, but the National School Boards Association right back on that statement, ready to stand up for this publicly. That is another thing that it is extremely, extremely hard to ever take away from us. Another victory and a building block we stand on today.
there's actually now an effort, this is the National Call to Action for Inclusive School Values that you can find on our site and on the sites of all the partner organizations signed on. And we have seen principals and school boards across the country actually lead discussions about what it means to be an affirming community for every child and post value statements to stand up for those values that are under attack. So as we put our values into action today, we are not alone. And where do we go from here? Well, for the rest of today, all of the sessions that you attend at this conference will provide many, many concrete ways that you can do this, whether you're working K through 12 schools, whether you're working in after school, whether you're working in youth service, that you can put your values, these values into action to improve the lives of LGBT youth everywhere. I'm grateful every day <laughs> that it's my job at GLSEN to do that and provide others the opportunity to do the same. Right now, as you just saw, the facts are clear. The gap between LGBTQ students' experience and that of their peers within and across all communities in this country remains vast. And our values, values that we now know are shared across the K through 12 education community, call us to do something about it. To live out our values by clearing away the barriers of stigma and violence and transforming the youth serving systems to support and affirm every single one of the youth that we serve. We know what works. We've seen that we've made progress and we have to continue for, to, we have to continue to fight for that progress because we know the lives that stand behind it. Our past experience shows us that we can continue to win no matter how daunting the odds may seem right now. Empowered by all of the defiance and the determination that I know is in this room, I have no doubt that we will. I hope that you enjoy the rest of the conference. I hope that you take action and I hope you continue to let us at GLSEN and us at all of these organizations doing this work know what's happening and what you are doing in your community to make our whole country the place it was meant to be for everyone. Thank you so very much. <laughs>